I'm Michael Barton, and today I'm going to be talking to you about surviving at school and succeeding at work. <coughs> now more than ever, I believe that we need to appreciate autistic people for what they're good at, rather than shunning them for not being like the rest of the population. In adult life, it's okay to be different, it can even be beneficial at times. However, at school, everybody's expected to be the same and to learn the same way. I found a cartoon online the other day which illustrates this point very well. The only issue with this is that, well, while it's fair in the sense that they're doing the same exam, I mean, it'd be really easy for the monkey, but I can't see how the fish is going to get out that tree without millions of years of evolution behind it. <laughs> the thing is, though, autism is a developmental condition which means that at school they can either be so far ahead in a subject that they're just way ahead of everyone else and they find it boring, or they're really far behind and that, well, it's just too advanced for them and they lose interest in it and they fall really far behind. <coughs> Being different at school is also an unfortunate key to the world of bullying, which means that autistic people often have a very hard time at school. But on the other side of the coin, being different can be a powerful asset when it comes to university or employment. You have to stand out from the crowd when you've got 200 people or more applying to just 20 or so positions. So this is when it's good to be different because employers need a reason to pick you over all of the different candidates. So I'm not going to just be talking about the differences that autistic people have. I'll also be explaining how to survive, not just survive, but to thrive in the workplace. So a little bit about me first. I was diagnosed with high functioning autism, age seven. I started off my education in a special unit, progressing to mainstream school with support. In 2014, I completed a degree in physics and I'm now working at a data analyst and have been working there full time for the past two and a half years. So now I'm going to talk about the challenges of being different for autistic people. The biggest problem that autistic people face today is the lack of understanding from the general public as well as people around them. The generally accepted autism prevalence statistic is that one in a hundred people are autistic. However, this figure has now been used for years. It's been suggested by the CDC the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, that the figure could be as high as 1 in 68, and potentially even as high as 1 in 45 for children. However, people still do not understand and appreciate autism in the way that they should. Tony Atwood, probably the world's leading expert in high-functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome, suggests that people with autism do not suffer from it, but they do suffer from the ignorance of other people. Autism is often referred to as an autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, which in my opinion is a very negative description of the condition <coughs> because autistic people often have a very highly ordered way of thinking and consider the world and other people around them to be disordered. <laughs> in my opinion, autism is only a disability, at the more high functioning end of the spectrum that is, in a situation when you're expected to be sociable because autistic people generally don't understand the unwritten social rules which everybody abides by. It's a bit like being left-handed in a world designed for right-handed people. Now, I'm sure many of you would have heard of the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which is a book all about trying to understand the opposite sex. It's quite interesting reading about the differences between men and women. It's even suggested, as in the title, that you've got to appreciate just how different somebody is. I'm going to take this one step further and suggest that autistic people are from Jupiter. <laughs> the main message which this book gets across is that once you appreciate just how different another person is, you can relax and cooperate with their differences rather than resisting and trying to change that person. This is exactly how we need to think about autism. <coughs> So I'm going to quote a few statistics from the National Autistic Society. 
From a study they did last year, they found that 84% of autistic adults are not in full-time employment. And just overall figures is that 32% of all autistic people are in some form of work, which compares to 47% of disabled people and 80% of the general population. So you can see that there's quite some discrepancy there in these figures. <coughs> they also say that over 40% of autistic children are bullied at school, which is a four times higher prevalence rate than for most people. And over 25% of autistic people have been excluded from school altogether. So you can see that time, life is tougher for autistic people. But I believe this is primarily because of the overwhelming lack of understanding and awareness of the condition. So that's a lot that needs to be done. The vast majority of autistic children attend mainstream school. So chances are, every teacher will teach an autistic child at some point during their careers. However, it's only last year that teacher training will become, has become compulsory, a scheme to be introduced in September next year, which was only prompted after over 7,000 people signed a petition, signed a letter directed towards the then Education Secretary, Nicky Morgan. This is based on the fact that 58% of autistic pupils said that the single thing that would make school better for them was if teachers understood autism. 60% of teachers said they didn't have the training they needed to teach autistic pupils in the first place. And 44% of teachers went as far as to say that they do not feel confident in teaching autistic children. So on the face of it, there's compulsory teacher training as to be part of a teacher's initial teacher training. Sounds like it has great potential, even though it is somewhat overdue in my opinion. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about a few characteristics of autism, because it's one thing saying you understand autism, but autism affects different people differently. But autism does have a number of core characteristics. Autism is defined by the fact that a person has poor social or communication skills. Autistic people also lack what's called a theory of mind, which is the ability to understand what another person might be thinking or what their intentions might be. Most people have developed a theory of mind by the age of four, but some children, and some autistic children, even up to the age of 10, cannot pass a simple theory of mind test. So imagine how difficult it must be for a 10-year-old autistic child that doesn't have these theory of mind capabilities that a four-year-old does. On top of all of this, autistic people have real difficulty understanding non-verbal communication. It's widely accepted that as much as 65% or two-thirds of our communication is non-verbal, by which I'm referring to things like facial expressions, body language, gesticulation and tone of voice. So only being able to understand a third of what another person is communicating to you will obviously make life very difficult. And then, when you use expressions and sarcasm on top of that, which autistic people find difficult to understand because of their literal way of thinking, they'd be lucky to understand half of the remaining 35%. So it's no wonder they have difficulties. Autistic people are also known for their lack of eye contact. I mean, particularly when I was in junior school, people thought it was rude when I was not looking at them and it's as if I wasn't paying attention to them. To me, I found that I was focusing so much on what the other person was saying and trying to understand their language, that I didn't have any brain processing power left to look at somebody in the eyes. I didn't really see the point of it anyway, because, well, I was listening to them. The thing is, autistic people also have an exceptional attention to detail. So instead of looking at somebody's facial expression as a whole when I'd be looking at their face, I'd probably be thinking something like, my God, he's got a big nose. So in that situation, it'd be beneficial for me to not look at somebody's face. <laughs> the strategy which my support assistant at school came up with to help me overcome this was to look at somebody's mouth instead of their eyes. 
which means that from a distance it looks like you're looking at their eyes anyway. Now this also meant that if I was in a noisy environment, I could try to lip read what the other, the other person and get a better idea of what they are saying. So given this purpose, I was then more able to focus on what the other person was saying and they knew that I was listening to me because I was looking at their face rather than looking out the window or examining their big nose. <laughs> Autistic people are also known for being brutally honest which can come across as being rather tactless or blunt. I know a joke about this, actually. So, a man went along to an interview, and about halfway through the interview, the boss asked him, what do you consider your biggest weakness to be? The man replied, honesty. The boss inquired, I don't see how honesty can be a weakness. To which the man replied, I couldn't care less about what you think. <laughs> the thing is, is that autistic people think it's more important for somebody to know the truth and they often don't consider the fact that telling someone the truth might hurt their feelings. It's not as if autistic people want to hurt another person's feelings, it's just that telling the truth comes first and foremost to that. Another thing which relates back to the difficulty of nonverbal communication, in a sense, is that autistic people need to be explicitly taught social skills, which neurotypical people, those without autism, can just pick up intuitively. Things like eye contact, knowing how close you're supposed to stand next to someone, uh, knowing when it's a suitable time to interrupt the conversation, or having the ability to know whether the other person is interested in what you're saying and is happy for you to carry on, or if they're bored out of their minds and they can't wait for you to move on. Autistic people are also known for having a very logical way of thinking. They see things in very black and white terms. This doesn't mean that they're colourblind, of course. They just like to see things at one end of the spectrum or another. And they find it very difficult to understand the grey areas in the middle. Now, for subjects like maths and sciences at the school, taking the most logical approach is usually the right answer. So this is a very efficient way to get the right answer. <coughs> However, in other subjects like English, the most logical approach isn't always the right one to take. I remember really struggling with my English GCSE. An exam question once asked me to discuss the humour in this passage. I didn't find it funny. <laughs> so my answer was... There isn't any. <laughs> now, in my opinion, this was the right answer. But I've since learned that I should have written a five-page essay on why someone else might have found it funny. <laughs> Here are some more examples of potentially illogical questions. Name the quadrilateral. Now, you would have thought that Bob, Sam, Tennyson, Kate, and Harry are perfectly reasonable names to give to inanimate objects. <laughs> I blame the question which should have said, give the mathematical terms for these quadrilaterals. Here's another example. Find X. said calculate x, I would have said, well, x is obviously five centimetres, you just need to use Pythagoras' theorem. But this goes to show that even in a subject like maths, which many autistic people excel at, the question needs to be phrased in a clear and unambiguous way. Autistic people also have a very literal way of thinking. So having good, clear communication is essential when speaking with autistic people. I mean, the English language is full of idioms, metaphors, colloquialisms, and figurative speech. Particularly when I was in junior school, I found it very difficult and confusing to understand exactly what people were trying to tell me. So the strategy which we came up with to help me overcome this was to have an exercise book in which I'd write down the confusing phrase or expression, I'd draw a picture of the first thing that came to my mind, and then my support assistant would write the true meaning below. Here are some examples. 
Take a seat. Now, when my mum took me to the GP when I was younger, and he asked me to take a seat, <laughs> I just looked up at him and said to say, where should I take it? <laughs> he laughed his head off. I wouldn't be surprised if someone on the spectrum seemed quite concerned if being told this. You're fired. <coughs> now, if people were to lose their jobs in this way, I'm sure The Apprentice would be much more exciting to watch. <laughs> and also, I feel like a pizza. <laughs> Again, this is just a small selection of <laughs> phrases that people use, which can be misinterpreted, many more of which can be found in my first published book, It's Raining Cats and Dogs. Now, indirect requests are something else which neurotypical people do when they ask you to do one thing, but they expect you to do something else. For example, would you like to sit down? Now, going by exactly what the question said, I thought that I'd have a choice. So I might have replied with yes or no. But this could well be, have been interpreted as insolence if the teacher wasn't aware that I was just answering the question. So what you need to do is make sure you say exactly what you mean when speaking with autistic people. Doesn't sound like much, but it can make a huge difference. <coughs> now, another indirect request can begin with, can you? For example, can you pass me the salt, please? Yes, I do have the ability to pass you the salt. <laughs> so it's a combination of all of the intricacies of the English language, which I describe in my latest book, A Different Kettle of Fish, in which I take a journey from the comfort and familiarity of when I was at university, going into central London for the day, and I describe what I see, how I feel, and how I interpret, in my, how I interpret the environment around me. Now, as with the first book, signed copies are available downstairs if you're interested. So now I'm going to move on to the topic of special interests. A special interest is an intense interest or obsession with a specific topic, which I to believe, believe to be one of the defining characteristics of autism. Now, one of the reasons autistic people develop these special interests is to help them control their environment in a world designed for neurotypical people where they can't have the level of control that they desire. Autistic people are also fascinated by all of the small details which most people don't usually consider, as autistic people have an exceptional attention to detail. As a child, I was interested in dinosaurs, sharks, and the universe, and, somewhat inevitably, Pokemon. Right, so, now moving on to Casper, Children on the Autistic Spectrum Parents Association. When I was a teenager, I went to one of the youth clubs that Casper helps organise, a small charity based in South East London, and for me it was a fantastic opportunity to mix with other autistic people and learn social skills with other like-minded people. And well, I say they've definitely helped me in practicing my social skills by going to this club every Friday for four years. And well, it was in last year that they actually elected me as patron of their charity, which I'm quite proud of. <laughs> so now at university, I've got a bit of time to talk about university, which I believe is a fantastic opportunity for me. I mean, going into university in the first place can actually be quite daunting for anyone, let alone autistic people. However, I feel that being different at university is much more accepted than it is at school. And because I have a lot more control over my environment, I can choose which subject I study and who I mix with. Now, the University of Surrey in Guildford actually has a special induction program specifically for autistic people, which means that they come along and move in three days before Freshers' Fair which for me is really <laughs> beneficial to help give me that extra time to familiarise myself with my environment, meet a few people there, meet my lecturers, and just organise the support that I needed throughout my time at university. As I mentioned, the mentoring and additional support was available to me at university as I was in receipt of the Disabled Student Allowance. And also at university, as I said, obscure interest can be a great way to make friends. I mean. Where else would you find a cheese appreciation society? <laughs> <laughs> I 
and having much more control over my environment than I did at home and being more independent made me much happier and less stressed than I ever was at home or at school. I'll just quickly glance over two things which have definitely influenced me throughout my life, uh, one of which is music, having come from a musical family. Music's also really good because, unlike cheese, music is a really common, common interest. There's all many people into music in some form or another, so it's a great way for me to make friends. I also found that having the routine and repetition in practicing a musical instrument, which are both essential requisites, are also things that autistic people find comfort in, having a routine and schedule to just help them along. And also, I've been part of numerous groups throughout my life, and jam sessions are a great way to meet people. Jam sessions are just like an open mic night, but specifically for musicians. So you can just bring along your instrument, and you can go up and have a jam and play some songs with other people. So yeah, here we have a picture of me playing bass at a local jam session, which all I really enjoy. Do you know something else which I found has really helped me throughout my life? Now, in this martial art, instructions are very clear and precise so that I knew what was being asked of me. And because it's a good form of self-defense, it's helped to prevent bullying. So yeah, great form of self-defense, great way to build self-confidence, and it's a great stress buster. And yeah, I helped found the University of Sari Judo Club when I went to university, eventually working my way up through the committee to become president in my final year. So, succeeding at work. Now, on my CV, I mentioned that I had high-functioning autism, but portrayed it in a very positive light, with traits such as being very focused, having an exceptional attention to detail, being very punctual, reliable, being a very quick learner, and being very honest. <laughs> the thing is, though, when it comes to looking at autism from an employer's point of view, most people tend to focus on the deficits of autism and what autistic people can't do. Whereas when it comes to neurotypical people, they often focus on the positive aspects of what they can do and just push to the side what they can't, which in my opinion really isn't fair. So I've mentioned, kind of mentioned the point of employment being looked overlooked. However, with an increased awareness and numerous companies actively recruiting autistic people, I think things could soon change in the near future. We've got companies like SAP, a German multinational software company, Microsoft, Vodafone, Ford, and even the Israeli Defense Force explicitly hiring autistic people in their visual intelligence department due to the fact that they have a very visual way of thinking and exceptional attention to detail, which naturally lends itself to the complicated and very specialized task of aerial analysis. I'm going to have to quickly go through this. I've only got a couple of minutes left. But yeah, having team skills is something that employers look for. And I believe that employers want different skills and original ideas brought to the table. And they need a diverse range of people. So it's in their interest to hire autistic people who often think outside the box. And having an autistic person's special interest could actually be the key into securing employment. So doing my time at biocar.co.uk, where I have work, I feel that my skills have been recognised, they sound very fast, accurate and very focused with my work, and that I'm a very valuable member of the team. So just two more points to mention, <coughs> two minutes, I won't be long, I promise. So I'll just read you a quick quote from Hans Asperger, one of the first people to document about Asperger's syndrome. Able autistic individuals can rise to eminent positions and perform with such outstanding success that one may even conclude that only such people are capable of certain achievements. So just the last point that I'm going to mention about the autistic qualities that scientists exhibit with their attention to detail, high level of technical ability, their logical approach to tasks and being highly conscientious as well as being able to focus for long periods of time. There are already an increased number of autistic people in the scientific community and with the increasing number of autistic people out there, I feel that in a few hundred years' time or so, people on the autistic spectrum could in potentially outnumber neurotypical people in the scientific sector. If anything, this could mean that instead of talking about an autism spectrum disorder, we could well have a neurotypical disorder instead. <laughs> How about this for diagnosis? 
neurotypical people have an inability to concentrate for long periods of time. <laughs> they lack the necessary attention to detail. They have a poor memory for facts and figures. They use elaborate language and do not say what they mean. And they like to talk about trivia instead of far more interesting scientific facts. So, yeah, that's all I have time for today. Thank you very much for listening.